Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the evolution of fish to tetrapods. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Unlike all the other tales in this series, we're going to tell the lungfish's tale first because it is the story of how tetrapods originated. The last tale left us between 340 to 370 million years ago in the early Carboniferous or late Devonian, but our common ancestor with lungfish lived about 415 million years ago in the early Devonian. Lungfish, class Dipnoi, are the first of several clades of fish we are going to meet as we travel backwards. However, all the tetrapods that we have met so far aren't considered fish. That begs the question, what is a fish? Fish are typically thought of as scaly, streamlined aquatic animals with fins and gills. Of course, not all fish have scales or fins, and some fish spend quite a bit of time out of water. More on that later. Conversely, there are tetrapods that do spend most, if not all, of their life cycle underwater, and some, like the axolotl from the last episode, retain gills even as adults. Yet, they are not recognized as fish. So what, if any traits, identify fish as fish? People tend to think of lampreys and hagfish, sharks and rays, ray-finned fish, coelacanths and lungfish as fish, but the tetrapods that include amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals are not fish. However, the tetrapods are phylogenetically nested among the fish. Some fish, like the coelacanths and lungfish, are more closely related to you and other tetrapods than they are to ray-finned fish, like salmon and goldfish and those ray-finned fish are more closely related to the tetrapods than they are to sharks and skates, and sharks and skates are also more closely related to the tetrapods than they are to lampreys and hagfish. That makes fish paraphyletic, a grade, rather than a clade, in the same way reptiles and Australopithecus are also grades. That means these taxa include some, but not all, descendants of a clade. As a result, there is no fish clade unless tetrapods are considered fish, just like there is no reptile clade unless birds are considered reptiles. The clade that encompasses lampreys, us, and our common ancestor is vertebrata, but we've got several more tales before we get there. We are now heading further back in time to the early Carboniferous, when various clades of early vascular plants were making their living, such as the Medulla sales and Cladoxylopsida. Lycophytes, like Lepidodendron and Sigillaria, stood tall over the swampy wetlands. Early ferns and horsetails were already established. Recent newcomers among the flora were the progymnosperms, like Archaeopteris, not to be confused with Archaeopteryx. These first appeared in the Middle Devonian. Though the names sound similar, progymnosperms were not gymnosperms. Instead of bearing seeds like gymnosperms, progymnosperms bore spores on their fern-like leaves, although in other aspects they were indeed more reminiscent of modern seed plants. Unlike the giant lycophytes, progymnosperms were the first truly woody plants, having woody tissue inside the trunk that is similar to that of seed plants like gymnosperms. In fact, when Archaeopteris was first discovered by John Dawson in 1871, it was described as a fern based on its leaves. The trunks were described as a gymnosperm and given the genus name Calazylon by Mikhail Zaleski in 1911. It wasn't until the 1960s when paleontologist Charles Beck recognized that the leaves and trunk belonged to the same plant, having characteristics of both seed plants like gymnosperms and non-seed plants like ferns. Today, we recognize progymnosperms as yet another paraphyletic taxon or grade, 
with some progymnosperms being more closely related to the seed plants than they are to other progymnosperms. The transition from spore-bearing to seed-bearing plants is further illustrated with the progymnosperm genus Runcaria from the Middle Devonian. It possessed some, but not all of the structures, of modern seeds. Runcaria lacked a solid seed coat and a pollen guide system that modern seeds do have. A very good example of a transitional fossil among the plants. As mentioned before, progymnosperms first arrived on the scene in the Middle Devonian. Bonafide seed-bearing plants appeared in the Late Devonian. Their arrival has been implicated with the faunal turnover of the Late Devonian, leading into the Carboniferous. From the Middle to Late Devonian, 393 to 358 million years ago, a series of extinctions took place at the end of the Ifelian, Gavetian, Frasnian, and Faminian epochs. These extinction events are rather poorly understood, but the end Frasnian extinction seems to have been the worst. These extinctions seem to have coincided with some volcanic activity in a few large igneous provinces, but there were also pulses of cooling along with pulses of marine hypoxia and anoxia. One well-known hypothesis is that large plants, especially the aforementioned woody progymnosperms and early seed plants, evolved which produced deep roots to liberate minerals stored in soil. However, this inadvertently led to a drastic increase of rock weathering and nutrient runoff. Upon deposition in the ocean, these minerals stimulated massive blooms of algae and cyanobacteria that resulted in widespread anoxia, killing off many marine animals. Similar algal blooms happen today. While this is possible, this hypothesis has not received much support from paleosol research or paleobotany. A more supported mechanism for the widespread marine anoxia is global changes in sea levels, which was first proposed in 1985. This hypothesis argues that shallow marine bodies become essentially flooded by rising sea levels, and the converse happens when sea levels drop. Indeed, major rises in sea levels correlate quite well with the end of all the aforementioned epochs. Plants could have played an indirect role with the extinction as well. With the growth and burial of massive woody plants, the atmospheric CO2 levels drastically dropped during the Devonian, while the oxygen they produced remained. Oxygen levels started to increase in the atmosphere, not necessarily in the ocean, at the end of the Devonian. This increase continued peaking in the Carboniferous that allowed insects to become enormous. In the late Devonian, a drastic drop in temperature brought on the late Paleozoic Ice Age that lasted until the end Permian. The appearance of glacial and interglacial periods could have been a factor driving these sudden changes in sea level. There was also the major tectonic activity present, such as the formation of the Appalachian Mountains, the closure of the Raic Ocean, and expansion of the Paleotethys Ocean. Again, the late Devonian extinction was instead a series of episodic extinctions taking place over millions of years. A single causal factor is unlikely to have been the case. It can't always be as simple as a space rock crashing down and killing a bunch of animals, now can it? Between erupting volcanic provinces on land and massive anoxia in the oceans, life was probably not too great for late Devonian life. Stromatoporoid sponges, rugose and tabulate corals, trilobites, brachiopods, ammonites, conodonts, and graptolites were majorly affected, as well as several clades of vertebrates, such as osteostraci, galeaspida, heterostraci, placoderms, and many of the totally aquatic stem tetrapods. But in the wake of the end Devonian extinctions, stem tetrapods who were capable of walking on land flourished, as did ray finned fish and chondrichthians. Interestingly, there is a period of time from the late Devonian to the early Carboniferous, 360 to 345 million years ago, that is historically known to largely lack fossils of stem tetrapods called Romer's Gap, after paleontologist Alfred Sherwood Romer who discovered it. At the start of the gap were well-known but nearly entirely aquatic stem tetrapods like Ventastega, Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, and Tularpaton, 
but at the end of the gap are a variety of land-adapted stem tetrapods. Where were all the intermediate faunas? Well, as more localities have been excavated, the intermediate stem tetrapods have rolled in to fill some of that gap. Ocenotus, Pederpes, Diploratus, and Crestigerinus hail from the relevant time period and have morphology intermediate between the totally aquatic and land-adapted stem tetrapods. Itinerpaton and Coilops are two stem amphibians from Romer's Gap, indicating that the split between amphibians and amniotes likely occurred in the early Carboniferous. With that background information, let's trace our ancestry backwards. There has been much debate over the phylogenetic position of a group of amphibian-grade animals called Temnospondyls. Temnospondyly represents a diverse group of amphibians found across all continents, from the Carboniferous to the early Cretaceous. They ranged in size from the 20-foot Mastodonsaurus to the 8-inch Amphibomus. Are they a clade sister to extant amphibians, sister to crown tetrapoda, or paraphyletic to amphibians? One old competing hypothesis proposed a link between modern amphibians with a different Paleozoic amphibian group called the Lepospondyls. However, more recent analyses seem to favor the former option as crown amphibia emerged among the Temnospondyls, specifically the former superfamily Dysorophoidia. Dysorophoids include members such as Cacops and the peculiar Platyhistrix, which possessed a sail on its back reminiscent of the sails of the distantly related synapsids like Dimetrodon and Edaphosaurus. There is also an interesting variant of the Temnospondyl hypothesis, but to understand this, you need to know that all the living amphibians consist of three main groups, frogs, salamanders, and the very odd worm-like Sicilians. According to the aforementioned hypothesis, all three groups descended from a common ancestor, which in turn descended from the Dysorophoid Temnospondyls. However, a paper published in 2017 by Pardo et al., describe the, dis the newly discovered Chinle stegophis as an early relative to the Sicilians. While Chinle stegophis is indeed a temnospondyl, it's not a dysorophoid. Instead, it belongs to a different subgroup of temnospondyls called the stereospondyls. Some members of this group were among the largest amphibians the world has ever seen, such as the aforementioned Mastodonsaurus. Other famous temnospondyls are the massive Prionosuchus and Coolosuchus, the last known surviving temnospondyl. If Chinle stegophis is indeed an early relative of Sicilians, this would mean that modern amphibians originated twice from two different groups of temnospondyls. However, this hypothesis has been contested by various studies, including a recent paper published in Nature from January 2023. Here, Kligman et al. described Fungus vermis as an early relative of Sicilians and a dysorophoid, while arguing that the features that Pardo et al. used to describe Chinle stegophis as a Sicilian were the result of convergently adapting to fossorial or digging lifestyles. So, for now, the best supported hypothesis for the ancestry of all living amphibians seems to be a single origin from dysorophoid temnospondyls. As we move down the tetrapod stem clades, we meet Bifidae, Colosteidae, and Wachiriidae from the Carboniferous who are increasingly less tetrapod-like. Then we cross into the late Devonian to meet Ichthyostega, Acanthostega, Parmastega, Tiktalic, Pandarichthys, Eusthenopteron, and various other fishy stem tetrapods. We run into the problem here of who qualifies as a fish and who doesn't. On the one hand, Eusthenopteron is very fishy, but still with clear tetrapod characteristics. But on the other, Ichthyostega is clearly a four-limbed vertebrate, still more primitive than any living tetrapods. Ichthyostega has limbs like a tetrapod and in general looks rather amphibian-like. Unusual for a tetrapod though is that Ichthyostega still has bones covering the gill slits, called opercular bones, seven fingers on each limb, a tail fin, albeit a small one, and a lateral line system as an adult. 
The lateral line system is seen on the outside as a series of pores that run along the face and down the sides of fish and juvenile amphibians that allows them to detect movement, vibrations, and pressure gradients in their aquatic environments. These pores are the openings of the lateral line canal under the skin, which is filled with water. Jutting into the canal are mechanoreceptors called neuromasts, which are tiny sense organs connected to nerves. When fish school, their synchronized movements perform two functions. It reduces the signal from incoming waves for individual fish within the school and can confuse predators. Fish are in an, an environment that is full of waves coming from various directions, so swimming synchronously in a school can help mitigate the chaotic waves. And since similarly sized fish emit similar pressure waves, this allows fish to divide themselves into schools of similarly sized individuals. The lateral line system evolved early in vertebrates being shared from lampreys to amphibians, but was lost in amniotes. However, the hair cells in the inner ear of amniotes are evolutionarily related to lateral line neuromasts. The lateral line system might have originally evolved as ancestral vertebrates switched from filter feeding to active predation, being co-opted from a primitive system of epidermal ciliated sensory receptor cells. Moving stemward, we meet Acanthostega next. Acanthostega had a larger tail fin than Ichthyostega, large gill openings, and an ear region for hearing underwater. It also had eight fingers on limbs less well-developed for terrestrial walking than Ichthyostega, but it did have a robust spine that would have helped it move out of water. Though Acanthostega may have spent some time out of water, it likely spent most of its time pushing through underwater vegetation. Indeed, tetrapod limbs were likely developed underwater and then later exapted for terrestrial movement. This is not especially surprising, as some fish have developed hand-like fins that they use to climb along rocks and coral, such as frogfish and the aptly named handfish. Next, Parmastega was discovered in 2019 and possesses a number of characters intermediate between tetrapods and fish. Parmastega is described as having tetrapod-like lower jaw, pectoral girdle, external dermal bone pattern of the snout region, and relative size and position of the orbits. However, Parmastega is also more similar to other stem tetrapods like Tiktaalik in its palate and gill coverings. These features together suggest that Parmastega was a largely aquatic, surface-cruising hunter. This is also likely the ecology of Tiktaalik, the famous stem tetrapod from Arctic Canada. It is one of the few stem tetrapods on this list to have a book written in its honor, Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish. Tiktaalik has fish-like scales, lower jaw, fin rays, and palate. However, Tiktaalik has a shortened skull roof, mobile neck, and wrist similar to tetrapods. Then in 2022, another stem tetrapod was announced that may be sister to Tiktaalik, called Quicktania. While Tiktaalik may have been able to support itself for short periods of time out of water, bizarrely, the fins of Quicktania are fully adapted for just swimming. This seems to indicate that while stem tetrapods were broadly evolving towards more terrestrial capabilities, Quicktania evolved in the opposite direction. Remember that evolution has no end goal and no foresight. Organisms merely adapt over generations to whatever conditions are in their environment. Pandorichthys has a very flattened body, upward-facing eyes, teeth with an infolded enamel, called the labyrinthodont condition, and a brain case like tetrapods. Pandorichthys also has gills, a large tail fin, and more fish-like limbs than our previous stem tetrapods. Finally, Eusthenopteron has dorsal fins and anal fins like fish, but like every other tetrapod and stem tetrapod we've met so far, Eusthenopteron has the characteristic tetrapod limb configuration. One bone, two bones, and then many small bones. The skull bones of Eusthenopteron are also virtually identical to those of tetrapods, differing only in relative proportions. So before moving on to the much more fishy stem tetrapods, it is worth pausing to consider what really happened in the evolution of tetrapods. By and large, what changed was the relative shapes and proportions 
of various bones, the skull, gill coverings, limbs, pectoral girdle, etc. Aside from the development of fingers, not much was really invented during this transition. Lungs, for instance, long predate this transition, evolving before the common ancestor of all Sarcopterygians. Lungs probably evolved even before our common ancestor with the ray-finned fish, but more on that in another tale. It's also worth noting that various other clades of fish have evolved the capacity to spend time moving around on land. Many gobies, sculpins, gunnels, eels, killifish, sticklebacks, the walking catfish, bashirs and reedfish, and climbing perch are able to wriggle across small stretches of land. Not with sturdy lobe fins, but wispy ray fins. There is even a cartilaginous fish that can travel across land between tide pools, the epaulette shark, which wiggle walks like salamanders. Most famous of the land-walking fish is the mudskipper that hails from mangrove swamps and mudflats of eastern Africa to Madagascar to Southeast Asia and northern Australia. While moist, these fish take oxygen into their gills and skin and even mate on land, the males doing push-ups to show off their prowess. Interestingly, some mudskippers are more adapted to terrestrial movement than others. The mudskipper Boliophthalmus has fused pelvic fins that assist it in traversing the mudflats of Southeast Asia, but Periophthalmus has unfused pelvic fins that allow it to adhere to vertical surfaces like mangrove trees. There is also a freshwater fish that adheres to and climbs vertical surfaces both underwater and in air, called the blind cavefish, Cryptotora thamicola. It too wriggle walks like salamanders, and it even has a pelvis reminiscent of tetrapods. Air breathing has evolved repeatedly in fish. Many coastal and freshwater fish are able to gulp air when moving from one tide pool to another, or when a body of water becomes hypoxic. The freshwater anabantiforms, the Siamese fighting fish, gouramis, climbing perch, and snakeheads, are noteworthy for their labyrinth organ, which is a highly vascularized outgrowth of the first epibranchial bone. When the fish are larvae, their first epibranchial bone looks like that of all other fish. However, as they grow older, the bone transforms into its diagnostic shape. Eusthenopteron is a member of the family Tristocopteridae, which also contains its namesake Tristocopterus, as well as Tinirao. Moving stemward, we next meet the two families Rhizodontidae, including Rhizodus and Sauripterus, and Osteolepididae, including Osteolepus and Megalichthys. The fins of these fish contain a humerus, radius, and ulna too, securing their position among the tetrapodomorphs. Lastly, Kinichthys and Tungsenia are considered among the basalmost tetrapodomorphs. Their diagnostic characters are coanae, two internal openings between the nasal cavity and nasopharynx. In simple terms, these are the two internal openings for the nostrils. Extant tetrapods have these characters, but fish, by and large, do not. Finding coanae in very fishy-looking animals betrays their ancestry. Fish generally have all the nostril openings on the outside. When water flows into the front opening, it flows out from the opening further, behind, but still on the sides of the face. In stem tetrapods like Eusthenopteron, the hind opening has shifted to the inside of the mouth. We can see the exact midpoint of this transition in Kinichthys, which has the hind openings right on the edge of the upper jaw. Modern lungfish also have internalized the nostril openings, but they did so independently from tetrapods as early relatives of lungfish did have all the openings externally. What was the reason for this shift in the early relatives of tetrapods? One good reason might be respiration. Instead of having to open and close the mouth, gulp, and swallow air repeatedly, the repositioning of the nostrils allowed stem tetrapods to breathe in air more efficiently by sniffing in and pumping air towards the lungs with the same muscles used for capturing and swallowing prey. Finally, we meet our common ancestor with lungfish 415 million years ago in the early Devonian. 
Lungfish live in freshwater bodies of Australia, Africa, and South America. Each continent has its own genus, Neoceratodus, Protopterus, and Lepidosiren, respectively. Of them, only Protopterus has more than one species, harboring four instead. Lungfish are omnivores, and the lungfish of Africa and South America burrow and estivate during the dry season, meaning they can spend months out of the water. To do this, the lungfish builds around itself a mucus cocoon, which even has antimicrobial properties, and greatly slows down its metabolism. In the axolotl's tale, we mention that the lungfish is neotonic. The reason is that extant lungfish look like larval lungfish, but early lungfish, like Dipterus and Florantia, do not. Early lungfish and their close relatives, the porolepiforms, have dorsal and anal fins, but the ancestors of our extant lungfish discarded these, retaining only the pectoral and pelvic fins. So that's the lungfish's tale. Tetrapods are descended from fishy ancestors that gradually adapted their bones to terrestrial life. There are a variety of reasons they may have done this. Protection from predators, shallow water hunting, needing to escape from hypoxic freshwater bodies, etc. Whatever the reason was, a clade of fish developed progressively more robust fins, pelvises, and spines for leaving the water, eventually culminating in amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.